you will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and the receptionist at a courier company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 8. Good morning, this is Sam speaking. How may I help you? Hi, my name's Marco and I'm calling to inquire about sending some goods to Canada. No problem. What's your full name please, Marco? My middle name is Pronto. That's P-R-O-N-T-O. -O. Sorry Marco, just your surname will be fine. That's all we need for the form. It's Sebriana Tori. That's C-E-B-R-I. A N A T O R I. Great. And your address, please? I live on Grimsby Place. Grimsby Place. Okay. But wait, you mean the address from where the goods will be collected? Right. Uh, in that case, I better give you my mum and dad's address. My stuff is there temporarily until I make the move. Same street, house number 25 in Grimsby, and the postcode is GB8. 6BY. Now, Marco, tell me what you'd like to have shipped. I'm moving to Canada, so I have a fairly big container for my belongings, you understand. Of course. What are the dimensions? It's two metres high, one and a half across, and three metres long. My, that's huge. Tell me about it. Moving day is going to be a nightmare. And what will this container contain, then? Well... To start with, there's my television. I'm also taking a brand new sofa bed with me, as well as my fridge freezer and home computer. I see. That all sounds rather valuable. Do you know the total value of the goods in the container? Yeah, I estimate about £5,000. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 9 to 10. Excellent. Now, shipping to Canada is not by any means cheap these days, so this is going to cost you £500? That would nearly pay for a new TV and sofa. It's a lot of money, isn't it? But as I said, shipping is an expensive business. How do you intend to pay then, Marco? Credit card, OK? Fine. Uh, I assume you are the cardholder. Actually, it's my sister's account. Money's a little tight for me at the moment with the expense of the move, so it's either a case of ask sis or ask the parents. Which would you choose? I see what you mean. OK, I'll take the details in a moment and confirm the collection date. But first, let me just ask you a few questions about your move to Canada. The Canadian government requires all shipping companies to carry out a thorough check before agreeing to ship goods into the country. And part of that check is a personal profile of our customers, you see. So, uh, why are you moving to Canada? My girlfriend's Canadian. I'm going to live with her. And what will be your employment status over there? Well, I'm travelling on a working holiday visa, but I hope to secure a work-sponsored visa shortly after arrival. I see. Uh, a holiday visa? No. A working holiday visa. That allows me to stay in the country for 12 months as opposed to 60 days with a holiday visa. Okay, no. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a talk by a representative of an agency that finds people to look after homes when their owners are away. He is talking to a group of homeowners. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eleven to twenty. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you've been able to make it to this introductory talk about our agency, which is called Contented Homes. My name's Gary, and I'm going to explain what our business involves. But first, I'd like to tell you something about the background of our agency. We commenced operations back in nineteen eighty nine. And essentially, our job is to find suitable people to live in and look after other people's homes while they're away. The homeowners, people like yourselves, might be away on holidays or temporarily working in another city or country, and they want to be sure that while they're away, their home will be secure, and that when they come back, everything will be in good condition. When we first started out, we conducted most of our business over the phone, but now the bulk of it is done over the internet. Basically, this is how it works: homeowners come to us when they need to find reliable, trustworthy people to take good care of their home for a limited period of time. The people who stay in your home and take care of it are called house sitters. The house sitters live at your place for periods of anything between one month and two years. There are all kinds of reasons why people house sit. Some are couples; others are single. Often they're saving up to buy their own home, or they may be renovating their own home and just need somewhere to stay temporarily, or they might have just moved to your city. Although house sitters don't pay you any rent when they're living in your home, they are required to pay any bills for the telephone, gas, electricity, and so on. So, for the homeowner, this is not a way to make money. When someone registers with us to become a house sitter, they provide us with some of their personal details, such as their age and occupation. I need to stress here that our agency does not carry out a security check on the people who have registered with us to be house sitters. Many house sitters have references from people whose houses or apartments they've looked after in the past. It's up to you to check those references. Allowing someone to live in your home is not a decision to be taken lightly. So we also recommend that you meet with any prospective house sitters. And interview them before deciding which person or people would be most suitable to look after your home in your absence. There are similarities between house sitters and tenants, but there are differences as well. House sitters don't have as many rights as people who have a lease on a property. As the homeowner, you can give a spare set of keys to your home to a neighbor, friend, or relative. That person's allowed to drop in on the house sitters without prior notice at any time, within reason, to check that the house is in order, and the house sitters aren't allowed to stop them from entering. There are many good reasons to use the services of a house sitter. Burglars soon notice when people are away, so theft is much less likely if someone is living in your home. But it's not simply a matter of security. House sitters keep your home clean and tidy. Some of them are even more house proud than the actual owners. In addition, many people need a house sitter to look after pets and keep the garden in order. Now, I'd like to tell you about the fees we charge. First, you, the homeowners, don't have to pay us anything. 
When people who want to be house sitters come to us, they have to pay $375 to go into our directory. That's where we get the money to run our service. As I said, we don't check to see that the information supplied by them is correct. It would simply cost us far too much time and money to do that. When you've decided that you want to go ahead and have a house sitter look after your home, we definitely think it's a good idea for you to take out insurance for your home. You'll find that many insurance companies prefer the higher degree of security if someone's living in your home than if it's left empty. Anyway, I hope I've given you a clear idea of our service. And now, I'd be happy to take any questions. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to Part 3. Part 3. You will hear a discussion between two university students on a seminar they have just attended. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Isn't it ironic that, at a seminar on public speaking and presentation skills, we're left so underwhelmed by the oratory skills of the so-called expert up on stage? Maybe we should lower our expectations a bit, Mike. After all, everyone is susceptible to nerves, especially with an audience as critical as us. Well, you, anyway. She's a professional. She's supposed to do this for a living, Alma. I feel totally let down and I'm asking myself exactly what I'm supposed to have gained as a result of spending this time here. Look, forget about her presentation skills, or lack thereof, for a minute. What about what she had to say? Did you listen to any of that? How could I, when she kept fidgeting and moving about so? I was so distracted by her antics, I couldn't focus on anything else, to be honest with you. I don't know if you can blame her totally for your not absorbing anything that's been said in the last half hour, Mike. You're a pretty awful listener at the best of times. Oh, come on. She should be able to hold my attention for 30 minutes. It's not like the talk lasted two hours or something. Mind you, it sure did seem like it. Stop it now. You're being overly critical, and that's just not fair. I took some notes and was actually impressed by some of what was said. I'm definitely going away having learned something and feeling like my time wasn't totally wasted. Emphasis on the not totally bit. Oh, Mike, when will you learn? You know, sometimes we only get out of things what we put in. Did it ever occur to you that had you given this woman a chance, you too might have actually learned something? All right, Alma, go easy. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Well, look, we have to fill in this feedback form on her performance now, and I want you to be kind, OK? Yeah, yeah. First question, use of equipment. It says, do you think the presenter made adequate use of the equipment at her disposal? What's a one? One is basically terrible. One it is, then. Stop it, Mike. 
She used the projector screen, had a nice PowerPoint prepared in advance and had some sound files to liven things up too. Yeah, it was a real hoot. Look, if you're not going to do this properly, I'll fill it in on my own. OK, look, seriously, I guess I appreciated the prep work that went into the presentation. And she did make good use of the room's IT facilities. So it wasn't as bad as I first made out. But I'm not totally enamoured with her performance in that department either. Me neither, actually. That's a fair assessment at last, Mike. She made an effort, but I would have preferred it if she had used the interactive whiteboard, perhaps, as well as the projector. Her presentation might then have felt, well, more interactive, I guess. A decent effort, though. Agreed? Agreed. What about preparation? Well, I think we can both see that a lot of effort was put in in that respect. Can't fault her there, can you? Not at all. How about clarity of speech and effectiveness at getting the message across? Well, look, you thought she spoke very clearly and that a lot was learnt from the seminar. I, on the other hand, learn more from my two-year-old nephew's utterances of nonsensical broken English. Mike! Let me finish. So perhaps the truth is somewhere in the middle. Agreed? I'll settle for that. Satisfactory, then, on both counts. Execution is the bit I want to get to, Alma. Oh, here we go. Was it really that bad? Oh, come on. You have to admit it was pretty boring. Half the theatre had emptied by the time she finished. I can't really argue with you there, Mike. Clearly, she failed to engage her audience, which is a big black mark for her execution. For once, Mr Critical gets his way. Mr Critical has been very kind to her in his feedback so far, though, wouldn't you say? You're a real saint, Mike. Now, what about the... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Section four. Emma Bell is an agricultural scientist. In the following lecture, she describes some of the advantages of the hemp plant. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. When we think of progress, we tend to look to the future. However, the past can also provide inspiration. Today, I'd like to outline some of the many ways in which the hemp plant, a plant that was used very widely until the early 20th century, can benefit both humans and the environment. You may remember that when the use of computers became more widespread, there was much talk of the paperless office. Yet now, far more paper is being used than ever before. Most of that paper is made from wood, but it can also be made from hemp. Hemp is a fast-growing annual plant that can be harvested within four months of germination, whereas a tree takes 20 years. This means that a hectare of hemp 
can produce 80 times as much paper as a hectare of trees. In fact, hemp was the main source for paper production until the 20th century, and the paper it makes is of superior quality to that made from wood. Many of the rivers in the vicinity of today's paper mills suffer the effects of pollution from bleach and other chemicals used in the manufacture of paper from wood. In contrast, paper made from hemp does not require bleach. So much clothing these days is made from cotton, yet fabric has been made from hemp for over 7,000 years. The trouble with cotton crops is that they take a heavy toll on the environment and are often dependent on irrigation. Hemp can grow using far less water and does not need as much fertiliser or pesticides. In fact, hemp crops even have a natural resistance to pests. Clothes made from the tough fibre of hemp also last longer than those made from cotton, which is not something that will make clothing manufacturers very happy. But another way in which hemp is the superior material is that it's more effective in blocking out UV rays from the sun, which can cause skin cancer. To top it off, clothing made from hemp is very comfortable to wear. In parts of the world that still don't have electricity, this versatile plant can also be used to light lamps. Back in the days of sailing ships, when hemp was used to make ropes and sails, lamps were often fuelled by whale oil, which gave off a much stronger smelling black smoke. The pursuit of that oil was one of the reasons for the existence of the whaling industry, which hunted many species of whale almost to extinction. Closer to our own time, Henry Ford used hemp in the production of his first cars. These days, with panels being made of metal, even a minor accident can lead to costly repairs. Being derived from a plant, hemp panels would be less expensive. Yet perhaps an even more significant consequence would be that instead of old cars being left to rust by the roadside, an abandoned car made from hemp would rot faster. A further advantage in the case of automobiles is the fuel. One of the major causes of global warming is the use of fossil fuels in cars and trucks. Methanol is an alternative to petrol and it can be extracted from hemp. This fuel is already used by racing cars and it doesn't produce as much air pollution, thus placing a smaller burden on the air we breathe. Hemp is also a source for a variety of foods. The oil that's obtained from the plant can be used to make cooking oil, butter, cheese and even ice cream. Flour derived from hemp has a greater protein content than normal wheat flour and its seeds contain all the amino acids, providing a form of protein that's more easily digested than that in soybeans. Carpets made from hemp are more durable than other carpets and are resistant to mildew, which grows in humid or damp conditions. It can also be used in the home to produce furnishings such as fibreboard, furniture and even plastics. Paints and varnish made from petrochemicals contain poisons, whereas this is not the case with those produced from hemp. Hemp plants are best grown close together and because they produce an abundance of leaves, the ground underneath the plants is shaded, which hinders the growth of weeds. So farmers don't have to spend money on potentially dangerous herbicides. It thrives in areas with low rainfall and may be useful in combating salinity because it doesn't need irrigation and its long taproot can reach underground nutrients and water. As a fast-growing plant, it's an easily renewable, biodegradable and ecologically sustainable source of a vast range of products that are currently made from polluting resources such as coal, metals, gas and oil. This is quite plainly a case where we can make progress by learning from the past. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.